here on my first business trip on the Big Island. And some of you may remember that that was also the time when the uh, over 7.0 earthquake centered off Kona happened. And I actually happened to be staying in Waikoloa when that hit. So um, I got an extra day on the island because the airport was shut down. And uh, so that was my introduction to doing business in Hawaii. And I keep coming back. So, um, and then we're going to transition from our individual presentations into a panel discussion. Um, and that's where we're going to loop um, uh, Chad into the group. He's the former HPHA executive director. So we've got 45 minutes for six of us to cover all this material. Uh, two of us are attorneys, so um, I, w I wouldn't bet on it. But uh, we're, we're going to do our best. And I'm going to have Ellen come up and uh, start her presentation. <clears throat> oh, one more thing I, w I needed to mention, and this to keep, keep this in mind, too. And I know we've already said it, but uh, Hawaii uh, Housing Conference at gmail.com for your questions. Good morning and aloha. Okay. Uh, Singapore provides an inspiring example of how one country can be able to successfully meet all of its country's housing needs. They have an island nation that's only half the size of Oahu, but with 10 times our density of population. Yet in the past 60 years, they've transformed from slums and squalid settlements into the world's third highest median income, full employment, full housing for all, and virtually no poverty or homelessness. So how did they do it? Well, they're master planners. They use a remarkably effective master planning process that involves all of their government agencies. They make 25 and 50 year plans, uh, and these balance the needs for things like income, housing, education, safety, military, and many other priorities and then they stringently monitor the progress and compliance with that plan for every governmental action and expenditure. Singapore believes that everyone should have a home. They've prioritized that as a value of the country. At this point, they've built over one million flats for their country. 82% of the population um, of residents there live in these governmental flats, and 94% of their population own their own home as a result of their building program. Singapore's um, public housing is available to anybody who's a Singapore um, resident, uh, permanent resident or citizen, and who has income of less than $14,000 per month, and who owns no other private residential property. Singapore has dozens of planned communities where it's built um, the high-rise affordable housing, the mass transit links to other services, the flats are built on government land, they are sold pursuant to 99-year leases, and they are sold at substantially below the market rate. The master plan also requires that there be concern for environmental preservation and sustainability, and so the newer, um, the newer complexes all have the, the walkability, the, the walking paths, the bike paths, and, and these mass transit links that makes it very easy. Most of the public housing in Singapore is in high-rise towers. Uh, the housing complexes have playgrounds, senior facilities, um, daycare centers, social facilities on the lower floors, and in the immediate neighborhood are things like your groceries, the goods and services, uh, the types of things that you need from day to day, and for many people, even jobs. The total density of each housing complex, as you look at this, is much higher than Hawaii's, but remember they're dealing with a population ten times as dense as ours. The integration of their housing with their transit plans, with jobs, with, with um, goods and services, makes the living situation in many ways very appealing, despite being in smaller units and high rises. So if you're a resident of, Hong, excuse me, of Singapore and you want to be able to purchase one of these governmental flats, you would go to My Nice Home Gallery. It's a one-stop center downtown. Inside there, there are dozens of choices of buildings and locations and sizes, and you choose what you want that's available. This is the most common size. Uh, it's about 388 square feet. That's smaller than US standards, but it's very livable, uh, and especially by Singapore standards. The prices for that without any subsidy are about $100,000 for a one bedroom, about $200,000 for a two bedroom, 
at about $300,000, this is US dollars, for a three bedroom home. Low and middle uh, income families are given grants up to $80,000 to help them purchase uh, their first flat. And as a rule, no one is paying over 28% of their income in Singapore for their housing. For those who can't afford to buy one of these flats, there's uh, rental flats available from the government. So people, for example, that are earning up to $500 per month would pay only uh, something under $100 for their flat per month. You can uh, choose, excuse me, I'll go back. I can't go back, that's okay, the last one. You can also choose the color, the flooring, the lighting, and everything else you want about your particular flat, and the government builds it to order. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, and this is my last slide anyway. <laughs> this is the Pinnacles at Buxton. It's a stunning complex of 50-story buildings, uh, high-rise housing, and yes, it is public housing from Singapore. The units have been so desirable that they're selling on the open market right now sometimes over $1 million per unit. The flat owners are the ones that are able to enjoy the appreciation of that because uh, they're required to be in their unit for at least five years, then they may sell on the open market, but they need to sell to someone else who's eligible for Singapore public housing. What's it done for me in terms of going to Singapore and seeing this type of model? It's made expect much more out of our government and out of, out of ourselves. I think we could be doing much better at being able to prioritize housing for our community and being able to build housing for our community. I urge you to support the Aloha Homes model. It's the first thing I've seen as a game changer that actually has the chance to increase dramatically the supply of housing by building dense housing around our rail stations that are walkable and that have an opportunity for many people to afford a lower price of home. In my mind, too, it's our way to keep country country by building density in our downtown corridor instead of expecting more development of our country. So I hope you enjoy the other presentations, and thank you for the chance to share some of my thoughts. Good morning and aloha. <laughs> it's like how many engineers does it take, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, a roof over every head. And that's the title of a dissertation that I found many, many years ago. And I couldn't get a copy of that in the United States, so I had a friend in Thailand in Bangkok who bought a copy and mailed it to me. And so I wanted to use that. And that dissertation was about housing in Singapore. So I thought it was an appropriate title to use. Uh, share some statistics about Singapore with you. Um, island, though the difference between Singapore and Oahu is that Singapore is just a bridge away from the mainland, where we are five and a half hours from our closest mainland. But that said, um, like I, Ellen said, it's about half the size of Oahu, population about five times, and there's some GDP numbers. And the last item on that table is uh, median home price to median income ratio, which is 4.8 for Singapore. Uh, now, research shows that anything over three is considered unaffordable. But keep in mind that for Singapore, this number includes market as well as affordable units. So you know, it's aggregate. Uh, compared to Oahu, which is 9.4. So how is housing done in Singapore? The housing Development Board, single agency that builds, sells, takes care of all the housing. It's a 2018-19 budget was 11.8 million Singapore dollars, which is about 9 billion US dollars. Singapore dollar is about 75 cents. And all the SDB affordable housing is 99 year lease. There is no fee simple ownership. And a five year owner occupant requirement. After five years, the families or the individual can, well, not individual actually, families can uh, sell the unit. And they are given one more opportunity to buy into 
the flats or the housing developed by SDB. And after they use that second chance, if they sell that unit, then they have to purchase the unit in open market at that point. And the price difference between what is produced by a housing development board versus market is astronomical. Uh, there is a lot of subsidy. As the table shows, uh, you know, a typical studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. Uh, where, um, looking at the numbers, the government grant is eighty thousand plus dollars. And actually, if you look at uh, the percentage of mortgage versus income of the family, at very low end, it's probably six percent of your. Uh, income goes towards housing, and at the upper end, it's about 24%. Here in the United States, and you will, uh, in um, Hawaii too, anything that's 30% or below is considered affordable. So from that perspective, Singapore has a much lower threshold in affordability than we do. But of course, all this affordability comes with a lot of regulations, right? Who can buy it? You have to be a Singapore citizen or a permanent resident to be able to buy units. Unlike here, foreigners can't buy housing developed by, developed by uh, Housing Development Board. I think everyone gets a copy of the PowerPoint, right? So, so they don't have to take pictures or anything. I mean, a lot of the financing is done through what I call the a 401k type of mandatory saving plan. You know, the government makes it a requirement on the employee and the employer to make contribution. Uh, currently, the employee contribution is 20% and the employer contributes 17% of it. And then, you know, individuals can use that for several things, like 60% of it goes to housing, um, investment and education, 40% for retirement, and health care. And, and families can borrow from the retirement fund to pay their mortgage, uh, you know, monthly mortgage payments and things like that. And at a very, very attractive rate of interest. The Singapore government just charges 1% over their uh, fixed rate, which is 6.5, sorry, not 1%, 0.1%. So the money you borrow from the Provident Fund, you just have to pay 2.6% interest. And like um, Ellen mentioned, um, uh, you know, several agencies work together. So with Housing Aid Development Board, there is the Urban River. really integrated throughout different agencies and all, so it works really well. They have a master, a 50-year master plan, and then it comes down to individual housing cluster development plans uh, and down that tier. <laughs> Takeaways, personally for me, it was, you know, integrate, integrated long-range and short-range planning so that, uh, you know, you, you don't rely on a 50-year plan. You look at the short-term plans, and if the economic situation changes, the housing demand changes, then they have a quick turnaround. And one layer of government, unlike, you know, most democracies, Singapore has one layer of government, so coordination becomes very, very easy. Transit-oriented development, when in one of the meetings with several agencies, a question was asked, and uh, do you, I mean, do you guys do transit-oriented development? They looked at us and said, what do you mean by that? And we had to explain. And the answer was, is there any other kind of development? <laughs> you know, so everything is transit-oriented. Everything is integrated with transportation. And very efficient use of developable land. I mean, it's an island, it's smaller than Oahu, so uh, land is used many, many times. For example, in a development, you would see 
train tracks as well as the transit station. Then you come to the ground floor, and then there's a public plaza, shopping centers and all. You go to the second, third floor, there are offices. Then you go fifth, sixth to the 40th floor. Those are all residential. So you have mixed use, you have multiple use of the land, unlike some other countries, I won't mention which, <laughs> land is used for only one purpose. So. And then on the other end of affordability, you know, not just reducing the cost of uh, building and all, what Singapore has done is that by using a mandatory saving plan, forces each individual to be able to buy a house which we don't have. I mean, we can. We have some, I would say, makings of a 401k defined contribution program that the state has started not too long ago. But I think we can expand on that. And of course, you know, there is deep government subsidy. The Housing Development Board's budget is subsidized by about a billion dollar a year by the government. And that's basically, in a nutshell, my opinion of what a Singapore housing model is. Thank you. Hey, good morning, everybody. Here we go. OK. Um, <clears throat> this is a good discussion. Uh, every, we haven't gotten together and talked about what we all took away from the trip. But for me, I was really interested in what we can actually apply in Hawaii. I mean, you know, Singapore is very efficient, very organized, but they're also not a democracy. You know, they got a benevolent dictator. Um, somebody like Stanley would be a good benevolent dictator for <laughs> us. But, uh, <laughs> but because of that, they have this level of efficiency that I haven't seen before in any government. Um, when Ellen and Deepak talked about alignment, these agencies get together ahead of time. They plan where the employment center is going to be. They plan where the parks, the schools, the playground, the housing. I mean, it's one complete master plan, comprehensive, and they execute, they implement. You know, they could put out 16,000 units in one year. That's amazing. I don't think we even can come close to that. Uh, so the things I took away from the trip, the alignment, um, you know, needing to get the government agencies in better alignment on infrastructure, transportation, um, just the common stuff, like where should we build? I think if you ask the government, state and county, federal, where you going to put, they're all going to be pointing in different directions. There's no common understanding of where, where we need to have new homes. Okay, yes, the, the, the strategic planning process was very impressive. Everybody's in a room, they have these disagreements, but when they make a decision, they stick to the decision and they implement. So they follow a similar process that Hawaii does so with Deepak's agency. You know, they do an RFP, they, have a, they select a developer, um, and they go through a, you know, basically a project by project development. But the other thing that I saw, which I think has opportunities for Hawaii, is they, they stick to a standardized floor plan. There's about five or seven different floor plans available. And they prefabricate or have modular components built in another country. In Singapore, they actually build it in Malaysia. They bring it back and they, um, oh, wrong guy. <laughs> They, they bring it back and they assemble it on site. And these things go, it's like Lego. I mean, they just go up. There's 50 stories high buildings, right? They change the floor plan on every floor. So you don't, you, the, the buildings kind of look unique. But it's a common floor plan and you can choose like what Deepak showed you. You have the different models that are available. But because of that, they get a lot of efficiency, a lot of economy of scale. <clears throat> Okay, so yeah, what we need to do, lessons learned is we need to be, get our agencies better aligned. We need to really focus on, if it is a housing crisis, why isn't government focused on getting more housing built? Why is everybody kind of all over the map on what the solution should be? We need everybody in the same room to agree and then start thinking about real solutions of how we're gonna build more housing. So coordinating with the federal funds for highways, with the infrastructure. So I'm glad there's going to be a panel talking about infra infrastructure later. Uh, how do you coordinate between the state and the county, um, you know, in, in putting in infrastructure? Because everybody got different funding sources. Everybody owns different infrastructure. So 
But the real one that I think there's potential for is if we start requiring the government housing projects, federal, state, and county, to require that the development developers use prefabricated material. Prefabrication was tried before in Hawaii and it always failed because it was always one project, one private sector project, and you don't have the volume and there's too much risk for investor to build a plant here. But if government were to commit and say, you know, like HHFDC, they have maybe five projects a year like over 10 years, that's 50 projects. And the, the city says the same thing. All of a sudden, you reduce the risk for an investor to bring in a factory or a plant to manufacture the panels. And that's not even talking about what the private sector could do. But you need to open up that. You need to minimize the risk for the investor to build a plant, commit to something, and then the private sector will kind of fill in the gap because people get real creative. They'll take a couple of panels, they'll piece them together to do some custom stuff. I mean, the opportunities are kind of endless right at, at that point. But you need something to get the thing started. You need an alignment. You need something that would reduce the risk for an investor to come in and build a plant. So I think if the state and the county got together and basically agreed to build all future you know, housing projects, government housing projects with prefabrication, that might allow for an investor to come in and build a factory. So those are the, kind of like my observations of the trip, real simple, um, looking for real world solutions. Uh, so thank you for your time. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Williamson Chang. I'm a professor of law at the University of Hawaii, the Richardson School of Law. And um, I'm going to speak for five minutes about what I took away from the visit to Singapore. It was really educational. I learned a lot. Uh, it enhanced my understanding of the larger issues uh, because Singapore, the first thing I want to mention is that Singapore views housing as part of a holistic process. Um, so I'm going to make five points. Uh, if you have my handout, it's going to be first. The idea of the uh, holistic approach that Singapore makes, um, the difference in the way they approach the idea of property and ownership. Uh, I think it's already been discussed by Dean and others that there's a completely different way in which uh, the administration and bureaucracy works, is collaboration, there's a lot of, it's professional. Um, the fourth thing I'm going to mention is that they view housing as a means of social engineering, not just applying housing for housing purposes, but it has social goals. And finally, I'm going to discuss very briefly one of the big differences is Singapore as a nation state controls its borders. And so it has the ability to say to people, well, you know, if you're an outside, if you're an alien, you, you, can, you have limited rights to purchase. So we really don't have that as part of the United States. Uh, and what I'm going to make, emphasize throughout this is that the uniqueness of Hawaii uh, is that it's an island state. There is no other state that's an island. We're 2,500 miles away. Everything is different here. The concept of property cannot be the same uh, in a place where there's lots of land, foxes running through your foxes and streams. Our idea of Blackacre, which was the model of the English idea for property, where they said it's a manor, and you have these castles and things, and you have streams, and you have foxes and things. And our idea of Blackacre is a two bedroom, two bath apartment, 900 to 1,000 square feet, 40, 40, stories in this, uh, 40 stories up. So we're working with completely different models. And one of the things I really am looking forward in what I do as research is how to create Hawaii's exceptionalism, how to create the idea that Hawaii has to be able to do things that are not uh, available under the United States laws. So going back to the first principle, the idea of holistic planning. 
The thing I'm, I took away the most important was Singapore's view that housing was part of a national goal. That national goal was to establish uh, several things. One is the idea of being Singaporean. One is the idea of Singapore citizenship. And most of all, the importance of having a stable middle class. That housing is the key for this political, social, economic rock that stabilizes society in terms of economic and social. And we're losing our middle class. I think the biggest problem in Hawaii is the brain drain, the youth drain. I talk to a lot of people. And when I speak to them and ask them what's the biggest problem, they say, you know, my son has to go and work in California, or my nephew can't stay here. When you talk to graduates, like a Kamehameha, uh, eight out of 10 will say, I'm not coming back to Hawaii. What that means is a completely different society. We will not be able to deliver to our children what we got. And that's how people, as it's been studied, measure happiness, which is happiness is not just a certain level of income. Happiness is, can you give your children a better quality of life? Can you provide for them the housing, the way, that, you know, I don't think my generation could match my parents' generation. And what we're looking at now is a housing crisis is one element of the, lo the loss of our youth, our children, and that's a part of it. So holistically, we have to look at jobs because jobs have a lot to do with affordability. We have to look at uh, other aspects, the cost of medical care, the cost of elder care. And I think that the lesson from Singapore was the planning was built around stabilizing the society. Society that is middle class where the small and middle businesses still survive. Um, the second point I want to make is Singapore had a vastly different approach to the idea of property and ownership, particularly appreciation. Appreciation in property is critical to people who live here. It's a way of accumulating wealth. You look at your home and you go, I hope it goes up in value. If you get some money, you buy another home. And there are leasehold system in Singapore that's really compressed. If you remember the old leasehold system, one of the things it did was suppress prices, keep the price down. When we went from leasehold, when we were leased to fee simple on the leasehold conversion, there was a huge jump in price of housing. And the ironic thing is that the Leasehold Conversion Act was meant to provide affordable housing. It did the opposite. Um, Dean covered the idea of planning the professional class, the tenured, well-paid class. It doesn't feel like it has to move from bureaucracy. And the other thing is everything is linked together. Uh, housing. It should be one-stop shopping for developers and people. They should, we have three levels, federal, state, county. People have to jump through all those hoops. And when we think about housing as just more than a problem of affordable housing as we conceive of it, homelessness is a housing issue. Airbnb is a housing issue. Vacation rentals, tourism, all those people, all those parts of our society that provide shelter. When you think about a military housing, the military's role in Hawaii, uh, can we develop along West Lock? So finally, a point about social engineering. Singapore uses housing to you know, facilitate other goals. The most important, or the most obvious one I saw was transportation policy, no cars. To get people to uh, accept the trans transportation, transit-oriented development, we gotta limit something, and I can't do it. I, I love my car. I, you know, I hope it's done after. After I, I, you know, I can't give up my two cars, my garage. But if we're going to look at Hawaii in the future, it can't be done. We have too many cars. We have a carrying capacity that, if we're going to even satisfy the need now. We have to limit cars, we have to respect you know, green, and we have to have things like, we have to think about housing care is also about elder care. So the reason people are leaving is not only just affordable housing, it's a variety of things, elder care, it's mostly jobs if we can't build an economic base. 
then people will not be able to afford housing. We'll have great inequity in our society. And one of the things Singapore really thought about was you know, keeping down the appearance of inequity. When you look around and you can't afford things and you look at very wealthy people living somewhere, that causes disruption and social disharmony. So those are my thoughts. Um, they come from more of an ivory tower. Well, we don't have ivory and don't have towers in Manila. <laughs> we have, you know, geckos. <laughs> um, but I will be very happy to talk to any, any of you about it. I'm very interested in how Aloha Homes can collaborate with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And I can talk to you about that more. Um, that's what I'm studying at the moment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, shockingly, we are running five minutes behind. Um, but I'm gonna try to make up some time. I'm gonna go fast. Um, all of my slides have uh, basically one I wanna say on them, so you can <laughs> refer back to them um, if you want to. Uh, I titled my piece of this presentation, Lessons Learned and Relearned, because when we were there, um, we were reminded that there are lots of things that Singapore is doing that um, we all are already um, contemplating, we're talking about, and to some extent we're even doing here in Hawaii. So it was a great reminder. Uh, we obviously learned a lot of things um, that, we, that we weren't aware of as well, but uh, I, that's why I, I laid that out that way. Uh, my outline uh, consists of these uh, seven points. And, and there's going to be a lot of, uh, I'll say, repeat um, overlap with what the, the other speakers um, have already said because um, I think we all are in agreement to, to some extent on a lot of these points and how important they were. Um, the first is to make housing a statewide priority. And second, fully integrate the housing process. Uh, third, we want to think in terms of neighborhoods, not simply buildings. Focus on incentives and partnerships, not on subsidies, uh, develop for mixed income and for mixed tenancy, so for sale versus rental. Um, and don't be apologetic about what we need to do to deliver more housing here in the state. And finally, um, uh, do a, a pilot project. So yeah, um, Singapore maintains housing as a, as a national priority, and and we've talked about that already. Um, I think we need to make that a commitment, um, not just at the state level, but at the county level as well. Um, we saw um, in Singapore, and I think we might be able to duplicate this in Hawaii, things like a sole housing agency and housing czars, but, and maybe do it at both the governor and mayor levels, and in, in, and they need to be invested with the uh, necessary, necessary authority and influence and, and, and implemented and supported with um, both human capital and financial resources. Uh, Singapore tax housing from both a horizontal and vertical integration perspective. I'm using those terms uh, loosely, but horizontally, and you know, we, 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 we've heard this from almost everybody on the panel, um, each of the departments cooperates, collaborates, they work together, and they also execute. Uh, vertically, Singapore government spans the entire housing development spectrum, and we talked a little bit about that already this morning too. All the way from a long-range plan to a short-range plan, up to land assembly, um, housing construction, and then even um, the management uh, of those buildings. So I think that's, those are some things that we can do as well here. Um, Singapore currently consists of about 23 clusters, things like a mixed use central business district, employment center, suburban housing, open space. And I've listed here um, the, many of the design considerations that they espouse. Again, these are things that I think we can do for inclusive and sustainable living um, that reflect those same uh, considerations. Uh, Singapore also executes a really clever twist on the P3 concept, public-private partnership. Um, 
They reduce construction costs, we talked about that. They subsidize the price, we talked about that. They subsidize their mortgages at below market rates, we still, we've talked about that. They also uh, provide grants in certain circumstances, we talked about that too. Um, and the set-asides that are placed into the Central Providence Fund accounts actually earn interest at above market interest rates. So everything is geared toward making housing affordable. Um, and then on the buyer side, we've also already heard about how the residents are required to set aside 20% of their household income, the employer another 17%, so 23% out of that 37 gets used, uh, can be used to pay for housing, both as a down payment and for their ongoing mortgage payments. Clearly, um, and we've talked about this, we cannot force our residents and employers to save for housing. Uh, we also cannot afford to provide subsidies. So there are some things that we can do. We can pump more money into the um, existing effective programs that, for example, DPOX organization uh, runs like the DERF and the RHRF and, and uh, the Hula May programs that, that aren't subsidies. It, what they are, are are programs that effectively recycle funding because that money gets returned back um, in the form of either zero interest or low interest rate loans. Um, we need to really focus on utilizing state in particular and also county owned land under a long term ground leases. We can even think about swapping publicly owned and privately owned land so that we get that, that publicly owned land in the places where it needs to be. And uh, uh, Dean emphasized this, but we've all talked about it. We really need to work at cutting our costs at every phase of the development process. Um, we've talked a little bit about this too. Pri uh, Singapore's primary focus is affordable uh, ownership housing. But in Hawaii, like in every other state in the US, uh, for a variety of reasons, home ownership is simply not an option for some households. And there's a list of some reasons why that is. I think we need to strike a more balanced approach than Singapore does um, between for sale and rental units, market rate and affordable. And that could look like many, many things, um, combining a Aloha Homes with a for sale um, um, focus with HHFDC, maybe with a rental focus. Um, Williamson talked about uh, integrating DHHL in, into the process. So there's lots of ways I think we can make that happen. Um, this is the, the, the don't apologize piece. So Singapore builds small standardized units. We've talked about that. They're, those units are in tall buildings. We've talked about that. They're on, they're high density. Um, they're with significantly reduced parking requirements. We've talked about the TOD um, you know, factor. They're using prefab or modular construction on land that is owned by the government with infrastructure already at the site. That's how you build affordable housing. That's how you. That's how you can build any type of housing, whether it's, whether it's market rate or affordable. And I think, uh, as a state, we can do all of those things, and we're already, in some instances, actually doing that. And so my point is that Singapore and Honolulu are not really a night and day comparison. So here's a shot. Uh, this is a few years old before Ward Village really got started, but the, uh, the yellow outline is the Ward Village project. This is looking west, and you can see. Hey, I'm going to actually use this. You can see uh, downtown in the background. That's high density. You can see all of these buildings that aren't technically part of the Ward Village project. Those are some high-rise structures. Um, if you look, if you look west, oops, I got to do this. Waikiki is 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 high density. Um, and then you go all through Ala Moana and to Kaka'ako. This is a rendering that shows how some of the buildings that are actually are already done now and those that are that will be under construction in uh, Ward Village look. That doesn't look that different from many parts of Singapore. Right? Here's the iconic uh, Marina Bay Sands Hotel in the, in the background. So we can get there. In fact, in some cases and in some areas, we're already there. Lastly, a pilot project. Um, I think we need to start in Honolulu. There's lots of reasons for that. Um, at some point, we need to get to the neighbor islands as well. Um, 
but I'm going to kind of uh, cherry pick some of the items on this list. We need to, as I already mentioned, um, fully utilize state and county owned land, do the 99 year ground lease thing. You know, Aloha Stadium is a good example of that. Met the Mayor Wright project is a good example of that. Those projects um, are in their planning stages. Um, uh, they could be a lot more dense and there could be a lot more housing on the, both of those sites. Um, uh, bring on-site and off-site infrastructure to the project. Streamline the entitlement and permitting process. Build with scale, and there's a whole series of uh, factors that relate to building with scale. Utilize modular and prefab construction. I think there's some work we need to do to ascertain how much cost savings we can actually achieve with that. But as Dean pointed out, if we can make that mandatory, at least on, on government-sponsored um, projects, we'll have the volume that we need uh, to get a factory out here. Um, I'm already starting to talk, and I know others are too, with um, some folks in the Bay Area, three different um, um, organizations that, that do this modular construction. Um, see if we can get anybody interested in Hawaii. Um, and also integrate automated parking systems. Um, I know that's kind of a new thing. I know it was done maybe a long time ago and was without um, much success, but it's completely changed now. And um, you, can get, you can get the same amount of parking in half the space, which in turn allows you to build more housing. So this is the... The Aloha Stadium uh, redevelopment plan, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. There needs to be more housing. Mayor Wright is um, looking at being clearly more dense than it was, but could be probably double the density that I think is currently being planned. And here are a couple of examples of two high rises that are going up in Oakland right now that are um, completely modular construction. They're approaching 25, uh, 30 floors. Okay, that's the end of the presentation um, for me. How did I do? See, I, I, just, I just added to the problem. Um, <laughs> uh, we're going to transition into the panel discussion and Q&A. I want to hit um, a couple of things real quick. So there were over 40 of us uh, that participated in that delegation to Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, we met multiple times in small groups after the Singapore piece of our trip. We did that again after the Hong Kong piece. Once we all got back, many of us um, prepared detailed trip reports. Um, we wrote articles, there were op-eds in, 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 in the papers here. Um, and so what, I'm try what I tried to do here with this list is, is delineate kind of the most frequent comments. And you're already going to hear, you've already gathered what those are because we all had a lot to say. Um, that was similar, but one is that housing is the top priority and leadership and resources and, um, support that. The collaboration among all the government entities and the authority to make decisions and implement the strategic system of planning from long to short term, being proactive about um, uh, supply and demand, be, being in equilibrium, minimizing costs and maximizing efficiencies, building on governmental land, um, installing the infrastructure, focusing on mixed use, um, we here need to figure out a way to overcome the down payment obstacle that's going to be essential for for sale housing. And we need to analyze and do a pilot project. So with that, um, I want to um, do a couple things. Remind everybody that at Hawaii Housing Conference at gmail.com, um, you can submit questions. I just got one here. Uh, but I want I want to loop Chad um, into this conversation now as kind of we you know, have a t discussion as a panel and answer some questions. Um, and so is there anything that you would um, either add to this list, Chad, or um, anything you want to emphasize? And then uh, we can kind of go from there. Uh, I just wanted to ask the people who went on the trip to please stand up and just stay standing so that People may want to talk to you during a break or something. So Sarah, and everybody, come on. You guys went, you paid your own way. You experienced something <laughs> yeah. great. And um, yeah, so talk to these people. We, we were all impressed with Singapore. We think it can be done. Aspects here, if government works with private sector, really pays attention and, and sets housing as a goal. That's it. 
Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna read I'm gonna read this question, um, and of course, if anybody wants to uh, to come up and ask questions, I think we've got microphones on the other side. Uh, this question questioner asks, what does Hawaii have to do to coordinate state, county, and private sectors for long-term master plan and execution to achieve a roof over Head. Wow. Okay, that's. I, I think that's the point of the entire day, much less uh, what we've been talking about. But um, is there anyone on the panel who wants to take a take a stab at that? Because I am going to defer that one. <laughs> I knew, I knew Dean would jump in. Uh, like I said, we need Stanley to be the benevolent dictator and yes. then it all, all come together. <laughs> no, I, you know, it's, it, 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 I, it, Deepak, did you have to go ahead, please? Yeah, I, I think the planning process, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar, is a pretty cumbersome process, right? And mm -hmm. uh, if you look at, um, in Honolulu, I mean, it's the city and county of Honolulu that's, um, responsible for most of that planning. I mean, there is a land use commission at the state level and state office of planning. That's kind of sets the 50 year, 100 year, maybe that kind of time frame on land use. And, and basically, you know, designating urban boundaries and what areas of the island gets developed and which areas should be preserved. That. Then at the second tier is the city and county of Honolulu. It has, I can't remember, seven or eight uh, community plans. Uh, out of which uh, two are, the only development plans are two, there are two development plans, right? One is the primary urban center that's slated for uh, additional development, and the second one is the EVA development plan. Uh, and I, I think after maybe 30 or 40 years, the city and county is looking at uh, amending, upgrading the primary urban center plan. That gives you the sense of time frame, right? So what Singapore is able to do is because of the coordination between the agencies and all, so to speak, turn on a dime when there is an issue about housing and commercial development and all. I mean, that is not possible. So I think it's one of the thoughts that I had, and I, I, would, I had said it in private, now maybe I'll say it in public. <laughs> I'm on record, right, on TV, so. Uh, and uh, I believe there are folks from city and county um, in a department of planning and permitting. Uh, maybe it's about uh, looking at restructuring some of the agencies. One example I have given is, um, you know, Boston doesn't have uh, Department of Planning and Permitting. What Boston has is a Boston Development Redevelopment Agency. Mm -hmm. So, re, you know, development is in the DNA of the agency. And I think at the city and county level, we don't have that. We have a planning and uh, permitting agency that's more a regulatory agency. So the DNA is more regulatory than development focus. So maybe that's where we can start. You know, we have redevelopment agencies, but that's created, I, I was the planning and development director of that agency um, about a year ago. I mean, I was there for 14 years, but that's a small agency that was created just to look at uh, the development initially of Kaka'ako. And I think that needs to be scaled, but not at the state level, but at the county level. Williamson, did you want to add something? Uh, yes. Um, the first thing I could say is, as Shakespeare said, shoot the lawyers. That was... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that would mean me. <laughs> but um, I mentioned one-stop um, permitting and planning. Now, it really seems like a, a pie-in-the-sky um, ideal. But when I was drafting the water code and working on water rights, um, I didn't understand the numerous plans that were being prepared. And I didn't understand the distinction that had to be made between the Board of Water Supply as a county agency, DLNR doing uh, its statewide job regulating. You have to get a permit from them, a permit from Board of Water Supply. And I felt like, what's, what's, why don't they coordinate and become one agency? Um, at least that should have been obvious, you know, with one Water. So you have all these different requirements to build. You have water, you have planning, you have environmental, you have lawsuits, you have you have EV and historic monuments. And like, 
you know, that's slowing us down. And the slower you uh, provide, you know, the slower the development process is, the more costly to the developer. He's taking out a construction loan, loans, and is paying the interest on that. And when it stretches out, so. As a lawyer, I have two, sided, two sides about the idea of people being able to sue and stop development. This is not Singapore. In Singapore, they would say, you can't do that. It would be over. <laughs> they would say, you know, it's time is up. Uh, they don't even allow you, to, you know, the eminent domain procedure is really not something we'd be used to. It's done in court. It's almost in secret. You got to take what they offer. And they don't, they, they do not acc uh, credit the appreciation value of land to the owner. The idea, and I think this goes back to the first prime minister they had was, you know, when things go up in value, that's not your doing. It's us. We built the infrastructure. And so when you take away the fact that appreciation belongs to the property owner, it's a completely new ballgame. A lot of us view the appreciation in our homes as a way of saving for elder care, for other things. And they're shifting it and saying, no, we'll take care of those things. We have a safety net. We're going to control prices. Uh, by leasehold. So th this is a very interesting idea to reintroduce with Aloha Homes the idea of 99-year leases because housing was very different when housing, you know, affordable housing was, you know, they would say in the old days, oh, look at that $100,000 house. People, the tourists would go by and say, incredible. Uh, you know, that was like Kahala. Um, the value in housing, the question is who's going to uh, be the one who acquires that value? And in Singapore, it's sort of the government. Uh, they paid, you know, when they, you know, did it in a minute of domain, they didn't pay very much for the land. So one thing is, I think there's got to be changes. One is take the bureaucracy, sort of merge them together. We have three levels, as was mentioned. At least we can get away with one, have one unilateral uh, approach and one, one agency. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, let me share my thoughts. Thank you, Williamson. We have uh, two more questions. We're gonna we're gonna just do these and uh, wrap it up because we're already a little bit over. Uh, Calvin from Eva asks, "Is it real?" And this is a similar and related question, actually, to what we've just been discussing. Is it realistic for Hawaii to achieve this model with all the bureaucracy and red tape in our government? Singapore has only one level of government. I'll speak. <laughs> I mean, we just kind of answered that question. I, I think it's realistic. Um, I think it's going to take, um, um, it, I went back to this first first slide, I think it's going to take um, um, Collaboration. It's going to take this, the the legislature, the the Senate and the and the and the House to work together. It's going to take state agencies working together. It's going to take the state and the county working together. And maybe that means, as uh, Deepak is kind of proposing, and I know Williamson has too, kind of um, something along the lines of implementing the redevelopment law that we've already got on the books here in the state, and um, or or. Uh, uh, creating a redevelopment area, maybe that. You know, I know. I think Aloha Stadium is already doing that. Um, um, but giving people the the authority to make decisions. Um, we were all laughing while we were in Singapore um, about how they've kind of got a crack heads and take names <laughs> approach to getting things done, and maybe we need a little bit more of that here too. Um, yeah, go ahead, Dean. Well, I think it's possible, but it's going to take political will. I mean, we need some leadership there, and it's incumbent on us to hold our elected officials accountable. If it is, if housing is a crisis, then show me your plan on what you're going to do about it. Why should I vote for you if you don't have a plan of how we're going to build our way out of this housing crisis? You know. Thank you. We need, we need the political will, we need the leadership. Everything else will fall in line if we f find that champion who's gonna get behind housing seriously and build more housing. Yes, and uh, our benevolent dictator, Stanley Chang, might be actually that person. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Justin asks, I know housing is important, but what are your thoughts on implementing a rental or housing cap to make rental property affordable to residents? 
And I'm not sure if he means that, um, um, uh, like in San Francisco, well, many, many places in California, where, where there's a, a rent control. I'm not sure if rent control is what they're talking about here or, or if it's the number of, of units. That wouldn't probably make sense. I think it's probably more rent control. Yeah. I'd have serious concern about imposing rent control. It's a real uh, change of the economic structure in a way that disincentivizes landowners to use their property for rent. If they can't make enough money through rent, they will simply transition that to something else. And in the end, it causes landowners to withdraw their land from the rental market, which causes an even smaller supply. A smaller supply means rents either go up, or if they're not permitted to go up, then you see more and more uh, pulling back from the market. So I think that type of forced change in the market is one that has very serious and potentially disastrous consequences to the people we're trying to help the most. Yeah, we've seen studies on the mainland. I think there, there have been one or even more studies conducted uh, by UH and others here in Hawaii, too, that have demonstrated that um, rent control is probably not a good idea. Dean, is there anything else you want yeah, to add? Yeah, it's a basic economics problem, right? It's, you know, limited supply and higher demand, so we just got to build more more units. Um, yeah, rent control, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, I think we just got to try and figure out how to incentivize people to build more housing. Yeah, it's, it's a demand and supply issue. It looks like we may have a couple questions over here. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Melody Aduha. My question is with regards to DHHL. I've heard that from the panel. Now, we know that the Eisenberg uh, Bolodrome location, 1.9 acres, is available, vacant, and an RFP has gone out. Has there been any consideration as to using that location as a pilot project? That's one thing. Second thing, how are we dealing with sea level rise given your modular type of uh, building and the automated parking structure? I think that's pretty great. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll take a crack at the first part of your question. Sea level rise is way outside of my area of expertise. <laughs> um, but I know there are people on the panel who can address it. Um, I'm actually working with DHHL and the team on A20 Eisenberg's Bolodrome project. Um, I think that RFP is due next Friday. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is that there's, there's already an approval um, for uh, 276 units um, based on the sewage capacity, but we've had another conversation with the city and county in Honolulu who has said that um, if any, if a, a developer applied for, um, to basically double that density, to get up to 500, maybe even 550 units on that site, that that would probably be granted. So we're encouraging um, a lot more units, a lot more density on that site. I don't know that it would necessarily qualify as a pilot project area. Um, um, because of the constraints associated with DHHL and its constituents in meeting those requirements. But um, um, it's a good thought, and I think DHHL is moving in the right direction with this new, you know, this is a new, it's a new foray into the rental housing um, area, and um, I think, I think, uh, I think it'll work out great. Regarding sea level rise, oh, are we wrapping up? <laughs> We're wrapping up, but sea level rise? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say about DHHL. I think that's a very good uh, future possibility because uh, the state has an obligation that it's not meeting to DHHL about $26 million. They don't get funding for housing. They're a housing agency. They have, because they're a federally granted, uh, federally established program, which is actually a form of exceptionalism or affirmative action, they can assert, and I think they should, and get from Congress exemptions from certain of the county requirements. Uh, that would empower people who joint venture with them. And I think that's a model that reminds me of Singapore in that there could be inclusionary uh, kind of housing where you would look at the population and say, as in Hong Kong, Singapore, so, so many percentage of this unit has to be of this ethnicity. Now, that is difficult to say in the United States. But again, I want to go back to the idea that we're being you know, hampered by laws and constitutional interpretation it's meant for very different situations. We're an island state. When you, you know, you know the problem is you get divorced, you're going to run into your ex at the shopping mall. <laughs> you have no way of, we are very close. And so property has to be looked at in somewhat a different way. Thank you. 
Uh, we've been strongly and I should say stringently advised to wrap this up. So would, would, would it be okay if um, those who still wanted to ask questions just come to us personally afterwards? Thank you.